I thank you so much, uh, Chairman. Um, Amanda Julius, um, based in Uganda, a radiographer. And tonight, um, I'm more than privileged to talk to you about uh, a not so common but simple and yet serious pathology, and that's the osseous endometrial metaplasia. Um, I'll try to be quick, but in case I'm too fast, please let me know. So uh, osseous endometrial metaplasia is the presence of mature or immature bone in the endometrium, and uh, it has been incorrectly called by others as endometrial ossification, ectopic intrauterine bone, and heterotropic intrauterine bone formation. And this is more, more commonly seen in women of reproductive age, though it has also been uh, reported in menopausal women, as we shall see later on in the, in the presentation. Uh, so uh, the process is uh, endogenous, uh, most of the times, meaning it has an insidious onset, it's non-neoplastic, so it's not uh, any form of malignancy. And uh, also important to note is that when you have this kind of pathology, uh, uh, the endometrium can show no more regular cyclical changes. And uh, in more than 8% of the cases that show up with uh, osseous endometrial metaplasia, there is always a history of uh, uh, pregnancy, a previous pregnancy or even a pregnancy loss. So uh, sometimes you can have hormonal or exogenous stimuli and mostly seen in uh, people who use IUDs and the, the, the IUDs can act as a, a factor that uh, stimulates metaplasia of the stromal cells of the endometrium. And uh, of course, the rare, but some cases have a mutational origin. So you have someone having a mutation and ending up with um, osseous endometrial metaplasia. So we wanted to start with a brief, uh, brief anatomy of the endometrium, or we know the endometrium undergoes different phases uh, during the menstrual cycle. Uh, the very first phase uh, being the, during the, me the menstruation or the, me <clears throat> the menstrual phase, where our, as we can see in this, image, we see endometrium appearing as a thin echogenic line that um, uh, sometimes in this menstrual phase, you can see some, some little fluid or blood within the endometrium, just as you can see near the cervix in this image. So in the menstrual phase, it should appear thin and echogenic. And after the menstrual phase, we have the proliferative phase. And the proliferative phase, we have the early proliferative phase and we have the late proliferative phase. So in the proliferative phase or the so-called trilamina phase, where we have the endometrium giving the trilamina appearance, uh, in early proliferative, we have the three echogenic lines, as you can see them. Uh, the middle line represents the opposition of the mucosal surfaces of the endometrium. And uh, the outer lines, the epigenic lines, represent the, the, the basalis of the endometrium. So the hypoechoic part in between represents the functioning or the functional endometrium. And as we progress from the early proliferative to the late proliferative phase, if I can get myself a pointer. Well, good. So as we pro progress to the late proliferative phase, we see the hypoechoic zone between those hyperechoic lines keeps on reducing. So uh, because <clears throat> the functional layer is increasing in, in, in size, so that's why we see that hyperechoic layer reducing in size in the late proliferative phase. And the last phase of the menstruation, which we have the secretory phase, we see that the whole endometrium is thickened almost uniformly uh, echogenic or hyperechoic, though sometimes it can be heterogeneous. And um, that's uh, in the menopausal, uh, uh, people before menopause. And in the postmenopausal phase, ideally, we don't have those cycles of the uh, cyclic changes in the endometrium. So what we normally have, we have a thin uh, echogenic endometrium, as shown in this image. And um, the cutoff values uh, for the endometrial thickness in, in postmenopausal women um, some literature that uh, I read um, by the book Diagnostic Ultrasound it suggests a new cutoff value of 8 to 11 millimeters in case there is no PV bleeding. And the reason for this is to try to eliminate uh, 
unnecessary biopsies of benign conditions in the endometrium. But in case there is TV bleeding, then the cutoff value is between three to five with an average of four millimeters thickness of endometrium in the postmenopausal women, as um, the size suggests possibility of malignance and thus warrant uh, biopsy. So um, going to the technique, uh, we always prefer transvaginal ultrasound over the transabdominal ultrasound. Of course, we all know the transvaginal has, because you have a higher frequency probe, <clears throat> and then there is less attenuation of sound because of the distance from the target and, and the probe is reduced. So we always prefer transvaginal and of course patients that are obese and we overcome all those challenges. And those patients cannot feel their bladders. And um, when we are measuring the endometrium, important to note, you take the sagittal plane of the uterus and you measure at the plane that is perpendicular to the long axis of the endometrium at the thickest point. And you should include the anterior and the posterior layers. So this is an image of uh, endometrium in the trilaminar phase. You see our trilaminar appearance, that's proliferative phase. So you measure from the anterior portion of the endometrium to the posterior. You don't only measure the middle part. That's to get the full length. And in case you have fluid within the endometrium, you should exclude the measurements of the fluid. So you take the first portion anteriorly, you measure it, take the posterior portion, and then add them together to get the endometrial thickness. And just in case you're not able to see the entire endometrium, which can happen, say, in, uh, patients who have fibroids or patients who are very obese and probably have not consented to the transvaginal scan, or because the uterus has um, a position that could be retroflexed, retroverted, and you cannot pick your endometrium very well, it's advisable you do not report the thickness of endometrium. Since you've not seen the whole endometrium, you might see part of it, the report it is no more yet pathology than another part for pathology. So in such cases, those patients are referred, referred for saline, histo, saline hysterography uh, to get to delineate the whole endometrium and then try to measure it very well. So this osseous endometrial uh, metaplasia has uh, multiple theories that suggest how it comes about. There are theories not yet concrete evidence, and there are many and controversial. Uh, the most accepted two include metaplasia in the healing tissue and uh, uh, dystrophic calcification within still uh, ovular tissue. So what happens with metaplasia in healing tissue? Uh, remember when uh, I was, I was uh, talking about metaplasia originally, we said in most of the cases, patients have a history of previous pregnancy or sometimes an abortion. So during the healing, after they have had an abortion and maybe they have had DNC, or even if they didn't have DNC and they just took tabs to make sure that they expel the gene products, sometimes we end up with chronic endometritis. And what happens with the chronic endometritis, uh, it stimulates proliferation of the mes mesenchymal cells. And these mesenchymal cells have an inherent metaplastic potential. So they can turn into chondroblasts or osteoblasts. And you know, when you have chondroblasts and osteoblasts, they will definitely produce bone. And you end up with bone within the endometrium. And another theory also postulates that the chronic endometritis causes release of superoxides, radicals, and tumor necrosis factor from inflammatory cells. When you go back to cells and tissues, you read about inflammation. When you have inflammatory reactions, you end up with the superoxide radicals and tumor necrosis factor being released by the, by the cells, the inflammatory cells. And this, the TNF and the superoxide will lead to metaplasia of the stroma, the stroma cells, and they turn into osteoblastic cells. Uh, but this usually happens in patients that have deficiency of superoxidase dismutase activity in the endometrium. So in the endometrium, you have uh, uh, an enzyme called superoxidase dismutase, and its primary function is to deactivate the, uh, the, the, the actions or the actions of the superoxide radicals. And when you have a deficiency in the endometrium of the dismutase enzyme, you end up with these cells turning, the stroma cells turning into osteoblastic cells, and the osteoblastic cells will definitely produce bone tissue. That's one of the most accepted theory. The other secondly, most accepted theory is, as we say, 
dystrophic calcifications of the residual ovular tissue. So what happens when now uh, from literature and also from the little experience I've seen, most of um, these people with osseous endometrial metaplasia have a history of an abortion, um, be it therapeutic or, um, or, or, or spo, spo, a criminal. And most of them, the abortion was done in the first trimester, actually before even, before even 12 weeks. So most times you have just ovular tissue, you do not have fetal parts within there yet. And uh, when we talk of dystrophic calcifications, I, I want to believe we understand that what happens in dystrophic calcifications, you have the tissue that has, uh, that has gotten damaged or that has died, and then you end up with deposition of calcium salts in the degenerated tissue. <clears throat> and important note in dystrophic calcification, there is no presence of systemic mineral imbalance. Say, um, uh, because we also have the metastatic, metastatic calcification as the next point states, the metastatic. So in metastatic, someone always has, uh, they, they, they have uh, 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 a systemic mineral imbalance, say hyper, hypercalcemia or something like that. But in dystrophic, the, there is nothing like that. There's no imbalance, systemic imbalance of minerals. So the time it takes for you to get this dystrophic calcification can take from as early as eight weeks to as late as 15 years in people of the reproductive age. So uh, in case someone comes and you see that, you can even take it and they can say, well, oh, I had an abortion, say seven years back, that would still count. And uh, the other theories that are less accepted, we have the metastatic calcification. Of course, here we say you have to have the systemic mineral imbalance, uh, say people with hyperparathyroidism and they end up with hypercalcemia and stuff like that. Then we, people, some people postulate it is just heterotopia where you have abnormal cells, sorry, where you have cells, cells or tissues growing in abnormal places. Uh, uh, others uh, uh, attribute it to prolonged estrogen therapy after abortion uh, because this prolonged estrogen therapy has an effect of promoting osteogenesis. And um, others think it is retained fetal bone. Uh, that is just within the endometrium. So those are some of the theories, but the most accepted is metaplasia and healing tissue and dystrophic calcification in the residual ovular tissue. So um, how do our patients present? Uh, most of these patients don't have specific uh, symptoms. Some might come with secondary infertility, and that's one of the commonest. And when, as I said, when you take history, they had the first trimester, either therapeutic or spontaneous abortion. And that's the commonest indication, secondary infertility. Everything else is fine. Some patients present with menstrual irregularities, same menorrhagia, they have uh, periods that last more than seven days or they have heavy flow. Uh, some patients are really completely asymptomatic. Probably they show up for different reasons, maybe just routine checkup or any other reason really, but not uh, concerned with the reproductive system and just pick out the pathology uh, incidentally. And even their cycles are very normal, even if they had an abortion before. <clears throat> Some patients will present with pelvic pain, uh, others present with dyspareunia, that is uh, pain on nerve in coitus. And some patients might present with uh, vaginal discharge. So the presentation really varies and it is not specific because for every of this painful presentation, you have a myriad of pathologies that can present that way. So. Um, when you go in and do your scan, uh, what you see, you see uh, shadowing hyperpoikilinia or irregular areas within the endometrium. And um, when you write your report, it's very important for you to describe the location of the uh, focus uh, or the foci, uh, the dimensions, that is the size, and then the number of foci. How many are you seeing? What is their location? And um, what, what is their dimension or configuration? So why, why it is important to describe the location and the dimension and the number is because, as we shall see, in this image, we see um, this linear hyperchoic focus within the endometrium that has been a posterior shadow. It is positioned in a, in a way as though it were an IUD. So that is how it will cause infertility. Someone will be as though they have an IUD position in their uterus. 
So this was my case. Um, it was uh, of a female, a 24-year-old female. Actually, um, the image I had initially was different from this. But then today, coincidentally, I got uh, this patient that I got for this case came sometime back, like some six months back. So I took the image of the printout. And then coincidentally, today I got another patient who had the same pathology. So this image is not of this very case that I'm talking about, but because it was better, because I had really, uh, really looked it out for it. Unlike the other one, where I took an image of the printout of the patient. So, but uh, such the same purpose was the same pathology. So the patient was a 24 year old female that uh, had secondary infertility and she had had an abortion four years ago. And the abortion was, um, uh, she didn't know the exact age, but she said it was around two months. That's when she aborted. And from then she had been having her normal periods. She had no PV discharge, had no lap. She was very fine. She actually moved on from the previous husband, got married to another man, and then this man now wanted um, a child. Uh, so when when we did the scan, there was that there was a linear echogenic focus in the endometrium that measured 13.1 millimeters in length. So a diagnosis of um, an endometrial osseous endometrial metaplasia was made and uh, the, the, the patient went and saw the doctor and the doctor decided to do DNC. And then immediately after the DNC, uh, we repeated the scan and the endometrium was normal. The epigenic focus was normal. So the patient conceived. So when the patient returned to my facility, they actually came to do a scan of their pregnancy to see how the baby was doing. But then they had the previous report that I got this information from. So um, or, uh, as we shall see later on, this method of management that was used, the DNC, is not the most ideal, it's not the recommended. Why? Because it increases the chances of the patient getting uterine synarchia. And of course, you don't want the patient to move from uh, osseous endometrial metaplasia to synarchia because the end result will be the same. They might still fail to conceive and the dysmenorrhea or the menorrhagia might even get worse. So um, uh, it's not the only appearance. There are quite um, a myriad of appearances depending on how many linear foci you have within. So these are just quite, these internet images I got from internet, just different appearances of how the osseous endometrium metaplasia could look. So you see the endometrium is appearing very cogenic. There is distal shadowing. Uh, you can see it's clear. It's not, it's not like an IUD, it's not a typical IUD. I remember uh, Mr. Kim Fuembe one time gave us notes about how the IUD would uh, look like the different, the Myrena and the copper IUD. So you see it's really different. And uh, this is another case. This wasn't my case. I put here, yeah, uh, <clears throat> it's from the internet. I, it just caught my eye. This was a postmenopausal 67 year old female who reported with lap and PV discharge, which was on and off for about three months, but she had no PV bleeding. And she had a history of two abortions with DNC that was done 34 years prior to this presentation. And when they did an ultrasound, there was a hydrometra and an echogenic focus within the endometrium, as you can see, you see this again focus with the hydrometra and the diagnosis of uh, DNC, sorry, the diagnosis of osseous endometrial metaplasia was made. Of course, um, important to note also is that the patient does not only uh, occur in the, in the endometrium, can occur in the cervix, can occur in the ovary, can occur in the vagina. And as I said before, it's important because the other states say in metastatic classifications, hypercalcemia with hyperparathyroidism can simulate uh, osseous endometrial metaplasia. And also you have to take the patient's history and know that this patient has not been using calcium or vitamin D for so long because this can also cause uh, metastatic calcifications in different places. And uh, you may not ask a patient, have you been on vitamin D for so long or something? They may not be, maybe, they may not be so taking care enough know that they have been taking calcium or something, but some questions you can ask. We know we have our calcium in our thiazide diuretics, we have it in the digoxin, and then we have our vitamin D in estrogen therapy, we have it in antacids, we have it in anti-B drugs and isoniazide. So 
you can ask the patient if they're on any kind of uh, hypertensive treatment and what drugs or any heart problems and for how long or they have been on any supplements of any sorts that can give you an idea of whether they have been on any of these drugs. And um, it's also important to rule out that uh, you're not actually seeing an IUD because an IUD is one of the differentials of osseous endometrial metaplasia. And it's also important for you to take history and confirm that there's a history of a miscarriage or a chronic endometritis. And the other important point to note is that an HSD X-ray would not be necessary because uh, the bone on X-ray would appear <coughs> radio, uh, radiopaque, just like the contrast you might use on HSD. So there's no need to take the patient for an HSD X-ray. And we, as we are talking, osseous endometrial metaplasia, we can give an impression of it on ultrasound, but the definitive diagnosis has to come from histopathology. So um, unlike my case, because we didn't have the services of histopathology, but ideally what must happen is after you diagnose it, the, uh, the doctor will go in, take a sample and take it for histopathologic analysis, or they may remove the whole fragment, but still get a sample for histopathological analysis. And on histopathology, uh, you see a plate of tabecular bone tissue that is surrounded by fibrous tissue and proliferative endometrium. However, there will be no cartilage, there will be no bone marrow, no chronic inflammation, and there's no trophoblastic tissue. That is, when you have that picture from histopathology, you can confidently say it was an osseous endometrial metaplasia. So it is very important when you have the facilities, same for histopathology. And the management, as um, I mentioned earlier, uh, can do a DNC, though it's not the most preferred. Uh, the treatment is not the most preferred because of the same reason. You have a risk formation of synarchia. And the most preferred management is ultrasound-guided hysteroscopic evacuation. Because with this, you have less chances of getting synarchia formation. And after the patient has been managed successfully, fertility will always be restored, just as my case who came back uh, with that, uh, who came back pregnant. And we have quite a list of differentials uh, for that kind of appearance. Um, whenever you see it, uh, of course, take history because uh, history helps a lot uh, in trying to differentiate these different pathologies and try to zero down to a specific diagnosis and one of one of the differentials we have is uh, the mixed malignant neuralian tumor or the so-called uterine carcinoma sarcoma uh, that's that there is a it's um, a malignant condition and that explains why uh, a, a biopsy and maybe the pathology might be important because you might think it's a benign condition which you're dealing with a malignant tissue and then uh, genital tuberculosis um in Africa, I'm not so sure about the literature, about its, uh, it, it being endemic or being common in certain areas, but genital tuberculosis is known to be endemic in India. Is it India or China? India, I guess. So when you probably are dealing with someone of that race and probably they have been in their region for some time and they have just come to your center, you might also want to rule out genital tuberculosis. And as I said earlier, it could be an IUD. Uh, it could be the IUD could be fragmented uh, because we have those abnormalities of an I, of IUDs. It could be fragmented and it has broken. It has broken into pieces, and for you seeing them as echogenic foci within the endometrium, and you're like, oh, this is metaplasia, osseous uh, metaplasia, osseous endometrial metaplasia. It could be an incrustation on only at the IUD. We know in the copper in the copper type of IUD. We have the copper, copper, copper wire surrounding the stems of uh, of the IUD, and those that copper rod that surrounding the IUD is actually releasing copper ions, because how it, how the IUD functions, it physically blocks passage of sperm, but the copper ions also help to denature the sperm just in case they are trying to escape. The copper released by the uh, by the copper IUD will help to denature the sperm. So, of course, we know copper, uh, copper is um, an iron, and we have fluids in there. There is also uh, gas rich in there, so you can sometimes have formation of calcium carbonate deposits 
and those they will also give an impression of um, calcifications that might actually give shadows and you might call it uh, osseous endometriosis yet it's incrustation on or near the IUD. And um, uh, uh, I, I talked to some members uh, here and they intimated to me how um, we do weird practices in Africa, it is common and I think it's no news everyone has had someone trying to do a, a criminal abortion using all sorts of hubs, all sorts of instruments. Some people insert much sticks into people's uteruses, uh, some insert metals, hubs. So it could be a foreign body that was inserted within the uterus for different reasons that we may not know, but it could be a foreign body. So it's also good to rule out possibility of a foreign body. Um, uh, then uh, the uterine sinaceae or the Asherman syndrome could also simulate uh, osseous endometrial metaplasia. And sometimes it, is, it can be calcified submucosal fibrosis. Uh, sometimes it can be endometrial gas. Uh, you know, gas, uh, good enough gas will give a data shadow unlike the clean shadow given by the osseous uh, endometrial metaplasia. Though if you have multiple small punctate foci within uh, the endometrium, uh, when the, uh, the, the osseous metaplasia is not a linear focus, when there are multiple foci, it can also give a shadow which may not be really that clean, so it might give a confusing picture. This is when history taking comes in handy, you take history, uh, of course, someone with endometrial gas um, might have other clinical presentations, unlike someone with uh, the osseous endometrial metaplasia. And um, sometimes you have retained fetal bone, so people who, whose pregnancy was, say, above 13 weeks and probably had an abortion to conduct, or you have been that uh, the fetus was crushed in utero uh, by the gynecologist, and then when they tried to evacuate, maybe a fetal bone remained. Because I've also seen cases where the patient comes and complains, uh, I, I had an evacuation, but I saw fetal bones come out of my private parts. And then uh, sometimes it's an endometrial polyp that is calcified. <clears throat> so it's also important to have that in mind. And uh, we also have uh, the gestational trophoblastic diseases uh, that can also be a differential, in particular, not the partial or complete mole, but we have the placental, placentocyte nodule and the placentocyte trophoblastic tumor. Those are also important differentials to take note. And uh, importantly, the placentocyte trophoblastic tumor is uh, quite uh, a stubborn tumor. It's, it's quite malignant and it's very important to recognize uh, because it can have uh, serious effects. Its prognosis can be worse in case it progresses. And in this, it's important, we all know with gestational trophoblastic diseases, our serum uh, HCG titers are high. So if, say, a patient has come and they're complaining of uh, infertility for years, <clears throat> and then you see something, probably you're thinking of the placentocyte trophoblastic tumor and the DOHCG and it's positive, then you can start thinking of uh, a placentocyte nodule or uh, trophoblastic tumor. And of course, it will help save the patient at the end of the day. Um, that was, well, those are my references, the ones, some of the references that I used, and that was the presentation. Your questions, comments, additions are welcome. Thank you. Back to uh, the moderator.